thank you very much and thank you for inviting me here. So uh, I'm not going to retell the story of what happened to my late wife, but yes, an airline pilot, she goes in for a routine operation and, and she dies. What I want to do over the next uh, 15 or 20 minutes or so is really just offer some reflections on the 12 years since about safety. Uh, I'm going to focus, not surprisingly, on human factors because it's an area that's not still given the um, coverage that it deserves. And I'm going to think a little bit about the future as well and offer some ideas. It's important to start with a disclaimer. I'm, uh, I'm not an expert in safety science. I'm not an expert in human factors. I'm just a bloke who blasts through the atmosphere at four-fifths of the speed of sound with 200 people under my responsibility. And I have to use safety science and human factors at a pragmatic level to deliver uh, those customers safely back to wherever it is they're going. And, and at the sharp end, sometimes you learn an awful lot very, very quickly. Obviously, I really know nothing about healthcare, other than the fact that I've been blessed, I suppose, after 12 years to be able to work at all sorts of levels. I've worked with politicians both in the UK and abroad. I've worked with policy makers in a number of countries. I've worked with uh, chief execs of royal colleges, of, of uh, trusts. I've worked at board level, and I've worked at all sorts of levels amongst the clinical community as well. And by the way, I've remarried and I've remarried arguably one of the most powerful people in the NHS, a GP's receptionist. <laughs> Luckily, she doesn't believe that. But I suppose that perspective has, has kind of helped me to think about safety in the broader context and where we might go from here. I want to cover four areas in a very short space of time. The first one is our mindset around safety. The second is the science behind human factors. The third is systems thinking. And the fourth, finally, is behaviours, which is probably an area that most anaesthetists who will have seen the video will be more familiar with. And at the very end, I'm going to link back, right back to the death of my late wife. First of all, mindsets. It's about 10 years ago that I stood on this very stage in front of a full house of anaesthetists, as well as the then chief medical officer, Sir Liam Donaldson. And one of the things I talked about was the difference between other safety critical industries and healthcare. And I showed a slide which said that in other safety critical industries, the big thing is we consider that error is normal. And that for me is still a fundamental thought really, that if you consider error is normal, you can start to plan and think about how you're going to avoid the possibility, how you're going to trap it, or mitigate against the effect of it. And generally I see in anaesthesia and particularly emergency medicine an acceptance that that is the case. But in today's healthcare you can't just think about a profession because you are dependent completely on all the other professions and parts of the system you work with. And I hope sincerely over the coming years that that sort of thinking can be spread to other clinical communities as well. The second thing is that if you accept that error is normal, it makes it easier for you then to consider how you might learn from it. And learning from failure is also a kind of an important mindset. It becomes acceptable once you accept error is normal. Matthew Syed has written brilliantly in Black Box Thinking about some of the research and the thinking behind that, particularly amongst the medical community. I have to say that over the last 12 years or so, healthcare has got better at learning from failure. But every so often, I get a phone call or an email completely out of the blue, and the conversation usually starts with somebody saying to me, Martin, you don't know who I am, but my mother or my father or my wife or my husband or my child died a few weeks ago. And what follows is sadly a story where people haven't been open with that individual, where organisations seem to have closed ranks, and indeed in some very sad cases, what can only be disguised as a cover-up has happened. And I can't describe to you the pain I feel when I hear that, 
because that says to me that there are still some parts of the wider community who still don't really get the benefits of accepting and learning from failure. So let me talk a little bit about human factors science and how it might help. The first thing is, is that human factors or ergonomics, the terms are interchangeable, are, if you like, is a collection of science. It's a pseudoscience, but nonetheless, these are sciences that are just as well evidence-based as any of the sciences you would use day to day in your medical practice. And as such, I believe, should deserve the same respect. The second thing about human factors science uh, is that I'm sometimes accused of uh, promoting it as being the cure for all the problems in healthcare. And that's certainly not the case. I don't intend to do that. There are many things we need to help make healthcare better. But having said that, if you can start to use human factors to understand not just what has gone wrong or right when things happen, but also start to understand why, and that's the real benefit of human factors science, then that is really powerful. And the other thing about uh, human factors science is it's about optimising human performance, optimising your performance in the system and optimising the system so you can perform at your best. Ultimately, we can reduce variability, increase effectiveness, increase efficiency and get better safety. And the final thing I just want to say about human factors science is it's not a medical science. It is a science about people and organisations and systems. And as such, although I take my hat off to people like Atoll Gawande, who looked at a human factors intervention and correlated it with clinical outcomes, a lot of the time that is potentially very difficult to do. If it's a people or an organisation or a system sort of science, then we should be looking for outcomes of measurable behaviours, of measurable system improvements, of measurable reductions in errors. Anaesthetists often think about uh, human factors as being just about behaviours or non-technical skills. And I have to take some responsibility for that, by the way. Uh, but the reality of human factors is that it's very much about preemptive, being preemptive and stopping these things happening and making things better. A and ultimately, therefore, we need to think about the design of our systems. Again, it is about 10 years ago, not too far from here in a restaurant, I spent an evening in the company of Professor Sid Watkins. At the time, Sid was the Chief Medical Officer for Formula One. Sadly, Sid has now passed away. But Sid spent the evening talking to me about the death of his great friend and the great racing driver Ayrton Senna. In the 25 years or so up to Senna's death, approximately one racing driver a year had died in a Formula One accident. And in the almost 25 years since, I believe only one driver has died in a Formula One racing accident. That is a remarkable improvement in safety. Sid was devastated by Senna's death, but what he didn't do was he didn't go out to the drivers and try and change their behaviours. He didn't tell the drivers to slow down and take it easy. What he did do is he campaigned for subtle changes in the track design. He campaigned for subtle changes in the rules. He campaigned for subtle changes from the manufacturers to make the cars safer. And he himself standardised and improved the medical facilities at the various Formula One tracks. That remarkable improvement in safety is a lesson in systems thinking brought to you not by a pilot, but by a doctor. We look at things like Formula One and we say that's quite complex. Actually, it's nowhere near as complex as the environment and the science that you have in your worlds. But what we also see when we look at high performing industries like Formula One is that the perspective of those at the sharp end, if you like, work has done, and the perspective of those at the top end, the leaders in that industry up here, is virtually identical. The people at the top know exactly what the people at the bottom are doing and understand that completely. If you like, it's what we call workers done and workers imagined as being very similar. Healthcare is incredibly complex, but what we see here is at the front line we have experts 
who understand the day-to-day -day reality, who understand the real world, who understand the trade-offs. And at the very top of healthcare, <laughs> we have the politicians and the policy makers who think they understand what's going on at the bottom, but often don't. And that's not their fault in many cases, it's because they are also experts, but they are experts in making policy, which actually in itself is a tremendous skill. But to get high performance, I believe we need to reduce that difference between work as done and work as imagined. And if there is something that I would love to see change in healthcare over the coming 25 years, it would be listening. Listening is a skill. And it's not just a skill for you, and it's not just a skill for those at the very top. Uh, politicians and our policy makers, it's a skill for our chief execs of our professional bodies, of our, of, our, of our NHS trusts, it's a skill for our medical directors, it's a skill for all of you. When you are working not just with patients but with colleagues, you're in some way a leader and simply listening and trying to understand what it is you can do to make it easier for people to do the right things because that's the nub of human factors, making it easy for people to do the right things. And if you can just find a few small things you can do to make it easier for others to do the right things, then you are making a small difference. And that starts to lead me into the whole area of behaviours, because you can't start to listen if you don't have some of those skills. And this sounds very simplistic, but it's true. When I look at healthcare and I look at some of the other safety critical industries, I see there are certain behaviours, certain skills, which are often far more absent in healthcare. Let me just take you back a step and let's think about medicine in the Victorian times. And I would argue in the Victorian times medicine was relatively simple. A patient came to a doctor, a patient had a problem, the doctor in some way gave that patient a, a cure, a treatment. Actually it probably wasn't very effective, but it was probably quite safe. And what that doctor probably needed was just lots of knowledge. The world today is very, very different. You understand medical science far better. We understand our, our learning is improving all the time as a, as a society. People are presenting now with what we understand are very complex comorbidities. And, and when you provide an intervention, you do not do it in isolation. You are working with multiple teams of people, many of whom you don't know, in multiple complex systems where multiple things can go wrong. Simply five years of medical school knowledge is no longer, I would suggest, sufficient. We need to start to see skills constantly developed around listening, around the asking of open questions, around areas of resolving ambiguity, skills of concentrating on facts, not personalities, and skills of explicitly identifying threats, errors, and mitigation strategies because these are the behaviours that ultimately help us deal with the complexity around us and give us a better chance of thinking about the unintended consequences of what we're doing. If though there is one behaviour or skill that we can really take away though from my late wife's death, it's this. When I describe what happened to my late wife, anaesthetists often say to me, I wouldn't have done that. The evidence actually does not back that statement up though. They look at my late wife's case and say it was quite simple. It was a can't intubate, can't ventilate. Yes, it was simple when you have read the report, when you have the hindsight. But at the time, I would suggest that what the anaesthetist and the team faced 
was actually very complex and extremely stressful. And what happens when we are stressed is our emotional brain comes into action. Our amygdala, our limbic system. What Daniel Kahneman's referred to as system one, what some of you will have heard in the popular press described as the chimp. Our emotional brain, despite all the training we have, jumps into action. Think back in your own lives to something that you did that went badly wrong for you. It might be in your social world, it might be domestically, it might be in business, it might be nothing to do with healthcare. And I would suggest that a lot of the time the reason it went badly wrong for you was because your emotional brain took charge. And I have no doubt that in Elaine's case, the emotional brains of that team were working overtime. They reacted really quickly, but wrongly. And the longer I spend working with people in healthcare, and the longer I spend as an airline captain, I'm really starting to understand that the first thing you do when something is getting out of hand, when something is getting complex, when you want to react quickly, is to stop and do nothing. And maybe turn to your colleagues and say, hold on, what's going on? What do you think's happening? What options have we got? What can you see that I can't? Because I would suggest that had the team done it in Elaine's case, yes, there would have been some damage, but the outcome would have probably have been different, not just for her, but for them. Thank you very much.